In this lecture, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the intimate private lives of colonial Americans. And in particular, we're going to look more specifically at what courtship was like for an early American, as well as why they married and what marriages were like. And then most importantly, we'll focus on what sexuality was like in the colonial era and what was expected of a man and a woman based upon the laws that existed and the moral codes from the church, and then what was actually happening based based upon historical accounts. Now, I've noticed that a lot of people have many images of what they think it was like in the colonial era. There are a lot of myths about the Puritans being these, well, puritanical figures who were very drab and boring and never had any fun. And some of the myths that people believe are true is that people in the colonial era only had sexual intercourse when they were fully clothed and under the darkness of night, that the women were to close their eyes and think of God when they were having intercourse, um, that courtship in the colonial era was much more romantic than dating is today, and that people picked just one person to court and then usually married them. Uh, other myths are that marriages in the colonial era were much happier, and people point to the fact that there were lower rates of separation and divorce to back up this, and oftentimes you'll hear people talk about the colonial era as though it was a golden age of relationships that we might somehow attain once again. And then lastly, most often students talk about sexuality in the colonial era and believe that it was boring and unoriginal and that people had no way of preventing pregnancy, so they really only had intercourse when they wanted to have a child. And yet most of these really are just myths. Throughout my lecture, I'm going to refute most of these myths. However, I wanted to start out by reading to you a passage from The Sexual Revolution in Early America, which is written by historian Richard Godbeer, who specifically studies gender and sexuality in early America. He wrote in his introduction, quote, Yes, strange as it may seem, American society is much more sexually uptight than it was in the 18th century the pornification of everything notwithstanding. Colonial Americans were a sexually open bunch, and they cracked dirty jokes, they played sexual pranks, they sang outrageously ribald songs, they drew scandalous cartoons, and they masturbated in the churchyard when they thought the sermon was boring. They spied on each other through the cracks in the cabin walls, they had sex in haylofts, and they told everybody they knew when they got laid. There was no expectation of privacy. Even the Puritans, who are usually thought of as the world's greatest prudes, believed that sex was a positive good within marriage, and that sexual satisfaction was pleasing in the eyes of God. So this was a lusty bunch of folks, well lubricated with alcohol, cider, and small beer. Now, what Richard says in this passage is that we often think that Americans today are very liberated when it comes to sexuality because of the pornification of society where we're constantly bombarded with images of nudity and sex. And yet, in many ways, we're much more sexually repressed than the colonial Americans were. Most of the traditions we're going to discuss will be related to the British colonies today, and in the British colonies, the settlers' beliefs on romance, marriage, and sexuality were shaped by a couple of different things. First of all, there was their religious beliefs, their medical views, their legal system, and lastly, their social structure and their accepted norms. We've spoken previously about the Protestant Reformation, which was that big schism in Catholicism where people like Martin Luther broke away and created the Protestant religion, and we also talked about the role of Henry VIII in accepting Protestantism in England as well as Queen Elizabeth I. And where it becomes relevant in this lecture is that the Puritans and the Pilgrims, the groups who we discussed wanting to purify Protestantism further or break away from Protestantism altogether, moved to the New World and brought with them ideas about sexuality, marriage, and relationships that rejected many of the norms of the Catholic Church. And in particular, they did not believe that sex was evil inherently, and they also didn't believe that their priests should be celibate. 
So what they did believe instead was that in order to channel lust and prevent sexual sin, a couple need only be married, and then marital love and reproduction could justify sexual intercourse and a healthy sexual appetite. In addition, the early settlers had medical views that very much emphasized the importance of reproduction and the necessity of physical pleasure in sex, and they had some false beliefs. For example, one of them is something called the myth of mutual orgasm, and colonists would have believed that in order for a woman to stay healthy and to conceive a child, that both she and her husband would need to actually achieve orgasm during intercourse. And so that meant, on the one hand, that both men and women could and should enjoy sex within their marriage. But on the other hand, when it came to issues such as sexual assault and rape, it meant that if a woman became pregnant after being raped, that the colonists would assume that she had willingly submitted to the man. The illustration that you see here, as well as the one on the previous slide, is an illustration of a book called Aristotle's Masterpiece. It was a midwifery manual as well as a sex manual that was very popular in England as well as the colonies until the 19th century. And it's not actually written by Aristotle, but someone who tried to pass themselves off as this famous philosopher, who had in fact compiled the works of many different men and put them together. And within this particular piece, we have all kinds of information about the beliefs of the colonists about sexuality and reproduction. And the content inside contains a lot of medical inaccuracies that were believed to be true by midwives and doctors and the common man well into the 20th century. And although this really was the best-selling guide to pregnancy, childbirth, and all things related to sex, in some places it was banned because they considered the content inside, especially the pictures, to be too sexually explicit. And in addition, on occasion, some men were caught using this as pornographic material. And when that happened, it would actually hurt the community because despite the fact that there was misinformation in this, the midwives who helped deliver children, for example, would not necessarily have a place to learn about what they were doing ahead of time. And the last thing that their beliefs about marriage and sexuality would have been based on was their legal system and their social structure. If you remember from our lecture on the role of women in early America, then you know that women in the British colonies lived under coverture. That legal doctrine that was adopted from British common law, where once a woman got married, her legal rights were subsumed by those of her husband. And so when it came to courtship and to marriage, it was often believed that in order for their inheritance system to work, where they had sort of a loose system of primogeniture and passed their land and their their wealth down to their eldest son, that women's sexuality must be controlled. And so they developed a social system of a very strict patriarchy and this belief that as, as a whole, women were considered to be lewd and wanton, they were seductresses, they didn't have the same mental faculties and capabilities that men did, so they couldn't necessarily be trusted to run the, the affairs of the country. Uh, and what this ends up doing is it leads to a sexual double standard. In the 19th century, it's going to lead especially to the rise of prostitution. But in the colonial era, you'll just see that men have far more, uh, permiss much more permissiveness in their sexuality than women do. Before we really look at the topic of sexuality, let's first talk about romantic relationships in early America, and specifically about the topic of courtship and how this leads to marriage. And the term courtship, it's not the same as dating that you think of today. It was a transitional period where young adults would start to express their desire for marriage to one partner as well as their sexual desires. And for us today, we consider that the only legitimate reason for marriage is love. But if you look at the Puritans, for example, they didn't regard love as a necessary precondition for marriage at all, nor did most colonists. They associated romantic love with immaturity 
and impermanent, and they thought that true love could come after marriage, that a proper marriage instead should not just be based on love and affection, but on these rational decisions about property and compatibility and religious piety. And so it was okay for a young man to pursue a wife just because she was pious and she had an abundance of money, so long as after marriage he could eventually come to love her. And throughout this time period, parents' opinion was really highly considered, and prearranged marriages were quite common. Fathers in New England had, for example, the legal right to determine which man would be allowed to court their daughter, and the legal responsibility to actually give or withhold their consent from a child's marriage. So a young man who courted a woman without the father's permission could actually be sued for uh, trying to fraudulently take this woman's affections and the person that he would be hurting in this suit would actually be the father under the system of coverture. Now this was even more important for the gentry. Now we don't have aristocracy in the United States. We had incredibly wealthy people but without titles and they were the gentry and they really needed to consider property alliances and finances in order to hold on to their wealth. In the early colonial days, marriage might have had very little to do with the emotional entanglement of two young people because emotions were fickle and they were not to be trusted. Romantic love didn't figure into a parent's questions and it's not until really the middle of the 18th century when parental, parental influence starts to decline that the concept of love gets any serious consideration as a matrimonial prerequisite. Today, though, love is popularly considered the reason for marriage, but for the best part of 150 years, colonial marriage among the gentry was arranged the same way that they still arrange marriages in many parts of the world. The higher up the colonial ladder of success and status, the greater was the pressure for the children to marry well, and the survival and the consolidation of a family's power and their property and their wealth was at stake, so this was incredibly important. Courtship and marriage were arrangements that would be of mutual benefit to both families, not just one, and love would just have to wait. Now, courtship was largely done in a public setting in the colonial era, so they might meet, for example, at community picnics or at balls or after church if they were in an area where they could attend church, but it was something that was overseen by the entire community. Everyone became involved. At what point in their life a person began to court really depended on whether they were a man or a woman. For men, courtship began in their late teenage years and it would lead to marriage in their mid-twenties because they would hope before getting married to have one, finish their education, and two, attain some kind of financial security to offer a family and a wife. Young white women, on the other hand, approached courtship and marriage much differently. After they completed their domestic training, they really enjoyed this late adolescent period as a special phase of life. Because they weren't yet responsible for running a household or raising any children, women had a lot more freedom during these years than they ever would have again. So courting gave women a lot of power. It was their decision whether to accept or reject a suitor, and some wielded this pretty ruthlessly. So while a woman might start courting as early as 15 or 16, many of them deferred marriage until their, their 20s, and others married quite quickly for fear that waiting too long could eliminate the availability of choice of husbands. The choice of a husband was such an important one because once it was made, the only thing that could undo it in most places would have been death. So marriage for a woman was a complete life change. It meant leaving childhood behind and taking on adult responsibilities and forming a new family. While some people like to think of the colonial era as a golden time in which teenagers were chaste and they focused on their religious beliefs and also pleasing their parents, the truth that historians have uncovered is far different. In fact, Many colonists in the 18th century allowed their children who were courting to bundle. As bundling was seen as a practice run at meritable compatibility under the family roof with bundling boards and sacks that would serve to keep the runners apart. So in the photo that you see here, the bundling board between these two individuals would allow them to sleep next to one another at night without necessarily touching. 
In addition, if you've ever seen the movie The Patriot with Heath Ledger, there's a really good scene in there of him bundling in a bundling sack where the woman sews them up into the bundling sack. Um, and the idea is that they won't be able to get out of this sack at night to get into any trouble, but they'll be able to spend some time together. Now, it's said that the precedent for bundling actually comes from the biblical story of Ruth and Boaz, uh, in which Ruth, who was a young widow, uh, and Boaz, a wealthy landowner, actually spent a night together on a threshing room floor, and they go on to become husband and wife. So bundling, also called bed courting, was introduced to the American colonies in the early flood of Scots and Welsh and other European migrants. Now, the cold, damp nights of the norm northern climate probably contributed to how popular it was in New England. Uh, bundling under the covers panders to a certain Scottish thriftiness towards winter. Um, heating bills as an 18th century ditty confirmed. It said, since in a bed a man and maid may bundle and be chased, it does no good to burn out wood. It is just needless waste. So the idea is that if a couple is seriously courting, they should spend a night together in the girl's bed to ensure compatibility. But there's one ground rule. Underclothes must be kept on at all times, and then parents would retire to their own bedroom, and there shouldn't be any hanky-panky going on. So to that end, the bundling board or the bundling sack might make an appearance. And bundling ensured that when as it happened regularly, the young girl became pregnant because oftentimes these bundling boards and sacks were not quite as um, efficient as they had hoped. There would be witnesses who could actually pick out who her suitor was and hold them accountable and make sure that they went ahead and married. So these young adults were certainly not saints, and temptations and opportunity yielded the inevitable result, and marriage by a spousal contract or in the church followed, and then the community would accept the offspring and life would go on much the same way that it does today. Now when we look at the rates of illegitimate pregnancies in the colonial era, we can see that after the practice of bundling really picks up, these rates increase by quite a bit. So between 1550 and 1750, about 10% of all women who walked down the aisle were already pregnant at their wedding. After 1750, between then and 1840, that number increased to almost a third of all women being pregnant. Now the penalties for women and for couples who gave birth out of wedlock might be a fine or excommunication or whipping, but most generally, as long as the man and the woman actually married, then the family would not be completely shamed. They certainly would look at it as dirty laundry. It's not something you really wanted to publicly air out in front of your neighbors, but it was actually an aspect of colonial communities that was quite common, and so the couple would typically take their punishment, which would usually be a fine, and as long as they paid this and they came forward and accepted that they had sinned in front of their church congregation, they would be accepted back into their community after marrying, and especially after baptizing the infant. When it comes to the process of transitioning from courtship to marriage, a woman's father was expected to provide a dowry, and usually a dowry from a woman would consist of like linen and household goods that they had accumulated, and any kind of money or property that the father could also afford to give to the couple. And then the groom's father was also expected to contribute something. Now, settling the question of where a couple would live and what they would take with them affected others, especially if slaves were a part of that dowry. And wealthy families even further had to worry about these ruthless fortune hunters who were just trying to ensnare wealthy heiresses and steal their money and property. And so often, especially for the gentry, negotiations would fall apart. And for some couples, they were left with heartbreak. For others, they were very resigned to their fate. And for a couple that was determined to buck tradition and to marry without the blessing and support of their families, it was really a choice between love and money. And just like with courtship, the wedding preparations followed rules that were designed to involve the community, both for the public record as well as for communal memory. So not only does the community become important in courtship and also in the process leading up to marriage, but you'll see that actually part of the marriage, the community is a large part of it. 
If you're wondering exactly when Americans began to transition into marrying for love, by the middle of the 18th century, parental influence over your choice of a spouse had really started to sharply decline, and one of the indications of this decline in parental control was a sudden upsurge in the number of brides who were pregnant when they got married. In the 17th century, fathers were supported by local churches and courts and exercised very close control of their children's sexual behavior and kept sexual intercourse prior to marriage at extremely low levels as you saw with those illegitimacy rates. The percentage of women who bore a first child less than eight and a half months after marriage was just 10%. Then of course by the time you get into the 18th century the figure shoots up. Now another indicator of this decline in paternal authority is an increase in children's discretion in deciding whom they're going to marry and when they're going to marry. By the middle of the 18th century, which is well before the onset of the American Revolution, the ability of fathers to delay their sons' marriages until their late 20s has really eroded, and greater freedom in selection of a spouse was also apparent in a gradual breakdown in the 17th and early 18th century pattern in which the order of a son's birth was closely connected to the economic status of his future spouse. And although most families in early New England did not practice strict primogeniture, the right of inheritance definitely did belong to the eldest son, and a lot of families would assign older sons a larger share of resources than younger children. So receiving larger inheritances themselves, eldest sons tended to marry daughters of wealthier families. And by mid-century, a close connection between birth order and a spouse's economic status had gradually declined, and as parental influence over courtship declined, there's this new romantic ideal of love that arises. So in the years right before the American Revolution, there's a flood of advice books and philosophical treaties uh, and works of fiction that help to popularize revolutionary new ideas about courtship and about marriage. And readers really learn that love was superior to property as a basis for marriage, and that marriage should be based on mutual sympathy, affection, and friendship. Rather than choosing spouses on economic grounds, you've got young people who were told to select their marriage partner on the more secure basis of love and compatibility. And if you look in a survey of all magazines published, during the 30 years or so before the American Revolution, one issue out of every four contained a reference to romantic love as the proper basis of marriage. During the next 20 years, the number of references to romantic love are going to actually triple. When it comes to marriage, the dream that many modern girls have in their head of a marriage day in which they wear this long flowing white gown that showcases a dazzling diamond ring and they march down an ornately decorated church aisle is definitely not the case of most women who got married in the colonial era, and in fact many of the different types of marriages we'll talk about didn't even happen in front of a church minister. The first type of marriage we'll talk about is when a couple entered into a contract when courting and unwittingly became married. So this contract was called a spousal de futuro, which was something like a modern engagement saying that they would be their future spouse. It's a marriage contract that will be consummated at a later date. And it was often the case that this couple, couple would just jump the gun and start living together. And if the girl became pregnant, which was often the case, the contract would automatically be bumped up into a full-blown marriage. And the couple would become man and wife in the eyes of their neighbor. So to the colonial community, really at this point, the pregnancy made the marriage. In addition, since the Middle Ages, there have been a couple of acceptable forms of do-it-yourself marriages. So for example, some of these common law marriages were practiced by immigrants and when they flowed into the New World, they brought the custom along with them. And the arrangement was a spoken marriage contract. It was either done alone or in front of witnesses. And it was especially helpful for a couple that didn't have their family's blessings. They would 
would, in one of these instances, join hands and declare that you took each other to be a lawfully wedded spouse and then start living together. And henceforth, from that time on, you were man and wife. It was a very short but sweet ritual that went by the name hand fasting or spousal. And parental permission really didn't enter into the picture because there was no priest or minister or magistrate and there was no wedding license. However, they did actually start using blacksmiths to officiate these ceremonies, and the anvil of the blacksmith became a symbol of where a long-lasting union was being forged. So the ceremony could very easily be performed in a field, in the garden, in an alehouse, and it was often the case that it was just performed in a couple's bedroom. And if you really think about it, this left open many opportunities for abuse. It's very easy to imagine a young man who is in his prime sexually promising in a, just a couple of words to have and to hold this woman for the rest of her life and then having his way with a young country maiden and later reneging on the deal. And this in fact happened quite often so that desertion became a very real problem for women who had married under common law. Another very common marriage ritual that has its roots in early pagan Anglo-Saxon traditions is jumping the broom. And some couples would take a broom and lie it over the threshold of their home, and they would jump over it to symbolize that they were married. Now, whether they took part in hand fasting or in jumping the broom, this marriage ritual was really frowned upon by some of the European visitors who came and wrote in their journals about marriages outside of a church, and they believed that such people as uh, those in the North Carolina backcountry who often practiced this were terribly uncouth and uncultured. But in a lot of places, like in the southern colonies and in the Chesapeake, families were scattered miles away from one another on farms, and the idea of building a church that people could attend was almost impossible. So ministers would then travel on a circuit, and they would only be present every couple of months to, you know, once a year. So if a young girl was already pregnant, or a couple was really eager to marry and start their family, then common law marriages were actually the best route for them. Sometimes these affairs ended very happily, sometimes not. For young girls, it was prudent to go ahead and hide a couple of friends in the closet to secretly witness the pledges and to forestall any kind of backsliding afterwards. They could then be summoned to give evidence in a breach of promise case if the young suitor was less than honorable and turned his eyes elsewhere. Uh, there are court records with countless stories of such betrayal where a young man would enter into a common law marriage with a young woman and then he would leave her and go marry another in another town. For those who could actually afford a traditional wedding, the time and the place of that wedding would be determined by convenience. So there wouldn't be as many farm obligations in November, December, and January, and these are the most popular months in which people would marry, rather than over the summer. And rather than writing out invitations or printing up invitations like we do today, a couple would simply issue verbal invitations to their family and friends. And then the morning of the wedding, all of the family and friends would come gather at the minister's home or in the bride's parlor. However, even when it was a traditional wedding, very few of them actually happened in churches. Even though the Bishop of London ordered that weddings should be held in churches, it was difficult for rural families and parishioners to travel out to the church of a family member. Now, whatever the location or the time, the ceremony was pretty much the same, and you'll see a lot of traces and hints of our modern uh, traditions when it comes to weddings in this. The ceremony is essentially a ritualized affirmation of family. Everyone has an obligation to support and nurture the new family unit, and the ceremony starts with a procession. The minister leads the group down the aisle of the church, or the family parlor, and then comes the bride and groom in their nicest clothing, then come the parents, and then the bridesmaids, and what they would have called the bridesmen instead of the best man. Um, and the bride certainly would not, at this point in history, have been wearing a nice white gown. That wouldn't have been until later in the Victorian era. So she might have been wearing any of her finest clothing of any color. In addition, oftentimes the bride and groom would give out favors like gloves or fans or hat bands um, to their attendants at the wedding, which is very similar to the gifts that are given out now to the bridesmaids and to the best men. <laughs> 
Um, the guests would then witness the father give his daughter away, and the groom would pledge himself to her with a ring. The couple would exchange their vows, and the bride would promise to obey her husband in all things. Now that ring was not like the rings that you see today, these very large diamonds along with um, the wedding band, but instead it could be any stone, um, and there wasn't always a set of rings. It could just be one particular ring, not a band as well as an engagement ring. Uh, the ceremony would then bind the couple forever in the eyes of the community as well as in the eyes of God, and it also bound the community to the couple. And in places like New England, it was incredibly important for that community to be involved in the couple's life because they were expected to be moral stewards who upheld the laws of the Bible within their community. Now, after the ceremony is when the fun really starts. Um, they would end up celebrating their wedding party at the home of the bride's parents, and for sort of middle or lower class circles, the male guests would race one another back to the house, and the person who got there first would get a bottle of alcohol. And the family, for their part, would have decorated a table with white paper chains, and they would have laid out food that was white, including two white cakes. And the guests would then consume the groom's cake, and Usually they would leave the bride's cake untouched and the couple would put this into a tin of alcohol and they would eat it on each of their wedding anniversaries. And this party could last for a few hours or several days. Now that idea of saving the cake um, for your wedding anniversary is one that we've also continued into the present day. So the wedding festivities often started with eating and drinking and toasting, and then they would continue with games and dancing, and they ended with the couple's exit from the bride's house. Anyone who slipped away from the dancing to rest could be hunted down and forced to return back, and various wedding customs might have taken place during the party. Young men might try to steal the bride's slipper from her foot. If one was successful, he could ransom it back to its owner for the forfeit of a kiss. And when the couple actually retired, their friends would follow them to bed to throw the stocking. And this is where each woman would throw a balled up stocking over her shoulder at the bride, and each man did the same for the groom. Whoever hit the target would be the next to marry, which is very similar to the idea of throwing the bouquet, for example, or tossing the garter belt today. When the bride and the groom left their parents' house, they would travel in a carriage, perhaps with a boot tied to the back, a symbol of a long and happy marriage, just like people decorate the bride and groom's cars today. And then they began their married life by visiting relatives and friends before settling down in their new home. The importance and the role of marriage in the colonial era cannot be overstated, especially because the family was the central economic unit of the colonial period. And during this time period, marriage was seen as a microcosm of society. The figure of the all-powerful husband ruling over a submissive wife, children, servants, and slaves was equated to be similar to a monarch ruling over his subjects. But as we move towards the American Revolution, families are really going to sw switch away from this ideal of strict patriarchy because they don't want to have the husband be perceived as a tyrant like King George. And instead, they're going to embrace a softened form of family rule called paternalism, in which men still have the ultimate authority, but they really do so in a much softer manner. They now have what are called companionate marriages. They are loving partnerships that are governed more by affection than fear, and it becomes more appropriate for a young republic to have such marriages. Men are meant then to learn to balance their own desires with those of their mate, and to practice benevolence at home in order to become better citizens. And the end result of this is not equality for men and women, either in public or in the family, but there does develop this this sort of notion that men and women have very different roles in society and that while those roles are supremely different they're both valuable as we discussed before in the early colonial period women usually married between the age of 20 and 23 but the age actually drops a bit in succeeding generations and was much younger in some of the locales than others. They probably spent up to about 20 years bearing children, and most of a woman's adult life was spent raising children. There were some large families with 10 to 15 children, but most had about 6 to 7. 
Many children would end up dying from disease in infancy and early childhood, and only about half of colonial infants ever reached adulthood. Most couples would have suffered the loss of at least one child, if not more. And the death rate was fairly high for husbands and wives, too. Newlyweds had only a one in three chance of living together. 10 years. Women often died in childbirth, and it's not uncommon to find an ancestor from the colonial period who married three or four different times. A woman needed a husband to provide for her and her children, and a man required a wife to care for his children and home, so it was particularly important to marry as quickly as possible. We often picture the Puritans and the Pilgrims as being these very strict, dowdy, religious folks, and yet it's interesting to note that among the Puritans and Pilgrims, divorce was actually legal in the colonial era. Both a man and a woman could actually petition for it. And the reason it was considered okay is because in their community, marriage was not something that was a religious contract, it was a civil contract. So it would be easy to obtain a divorce on grounds such as adultery, desertion, or cruelty. Despite the fact that it was allowable, there was a very low frequency of divorce. It's nothing like the divorce rate today. If you look at the Plymouth Colony during 72 years of existence, there were roughly 40 petitions in all of Massachusetts at that point, and they granted about six divorces in Plymouth. So the low frequency, we think, can be attributed to two things. First is that there was a huge social stigma attached to divorce because of the view of a failing marriage and of the duties that a husband and a wife had to one another. And the second was that desertion was actually more common than divorce. There are a lot of examples of husbands and wives deserting one another and going to live with a new partner. So the average length of a marriage was less than 12 years because of those high mortality rates we discussed. One third to one half of all children lost at least one parent before the age of 21. And over half of all children, 13 and under, had lost at least one parent. So clearly, just because there were low rates of divorce, this doesn't necessarily make the most stable and reliable families. In comparison to New England, though, in the South and in the Chesapeake, divorce was nearly impossible to attain. Later on in the colonial era, colonists had the ability to petition the General Assembly or the Legislative Assembly and then later on the courts for a divorce. But usually, the courts would only grant what was called a divorce amensa et thora, which means a divorce from bed and board. And that was essentially a legal separation, which meant that a couple would be separated, but they could never remarry. And in order to grant this legal separation, they would need to have proof of something like extreme life-threatening violence, desertion for over seven years, adultery on the part of a woman, but not really on the part of a man, or some other really heinous crime. The only real grounds for a divorce would have been an annulment because of consanguinity, marrying within the family, or bigamy, having multiple um, spouses. Most of these allowances were granted to men, as women rarely petitioned until after the American Revolution, and even then, very few allowances were granted. Divorce was viewed as a personal failing. It was viewed as a failing of a woman to uphold her wifely duties and of a man to protect and take care of his family. It was also viewed as a failure of the larger community as moral stewards. It simply was not the best option for unhappy couples, and we have records of many unhappy husbands and wives who simply chose to remain married and they bickered and fought with one another until their deaths. Throughout this first half of the lecture, you've likely seen that the reason for engaging in relationships and marriages in the past is certainly not the same as our own reasons today. They had property alliances, finances, and power structures to consider, and they listened to their parents, especially their father, far more than young couples today. And even marriages weren't the same as those today, because high mortality rates meant many more remarriages, and low divorce rates meant the inability to truly escape your chosen spouse until death do you part. Not to mention the high infant mortality rates meant that many couples suffered through the loss of a child. But the actual human interaction, once these relationships were formed, was much the same as it is today.
couples shared the joys of births, holidays, plentiful harvest, and all the bounty that life has to offer. They fought about many of the same things that couples do today. Money, sex, the children, housework, and even who was showing enough affection. And in the next part of the lecture, you will come to see that the intimate lives of colonial Americans were also quite similar to those of people today. On the whole, they were not a shy bunch, and they saw their sexual partnerships as one of the great joys of their life.